vacation uh, with my uh, friends in uh, Turkey. Um, a beautiful, beautiful place that I have visited numerous times and always enjoyed my visits. Management of deep-seated cavernous malformations is particularly important because uh, this particular entity taught us many, many different routes to the deep portions of the brain, whether it's in the brain stem or the thalamus, uh, by these lesions not having any boundaries, uh, they created a need for us to get to the very deepest portions of the brain. And so my experience with uh, cavernous malformations has been uh, fortuitously uh, very large with well over a thousand cavernous malformation and well over 500 brainstem cavernous malformations. So my goal is to summarize what we know, um, to also emphasize contraindications for surgery, and naturally, very importantly, indications for surgery. The decision rationale, we'll spend some time on that. The safe entry zones, and then the conclusions. So I, I wanna start off with just showing this particular case, which is a uh, large cavernous malformation in the brainstem, no treatment occurred. And then two years later, it looked like this. And if you would have radiated this patient, you would have thought you'd really gotten a good result. But this is nothing more than the natural history because the blood has reabsorbed. A year after this, uh, the patient uh, bled again. When do we not operate? Well, when you have a patient that has this sort of a cavernous malformation below the floor of the fourth ventricle, where the floor of the fourth ventricle is completely intact, that patient will be hurt if you try to take out this cavernous malformation. So very important to recognize what patients you should not operate on. Just to emphasize this point, we did a study with uh, one of the residents, um, Dr. Hahn, in which we prospectively selected patients for surgery and not surgery um, when they were referred to us. So of those patients that were referred to us in this time period between 497 to 599, um, we had 87 patients referred to us with brainstem cavernous malformation. And we only recommended surgery in basically half the patients. And that is important because these are patients already selected for surgery by the referring physician. What are the indications for surgery? Well, they have to be accessible, whether it's on a peel surface or they have repeated hemorrhages or they have a progressive neurological deficit, significant mass effect, and if you can reach them through a safe entry zone. So what do we know? Well, we know that they're associated with veins, whether we call them venous anomalies or abnormal veins. I per personally believe these are venous entities. They really come from budding of the small veins that are associated with these abnormal veins. Uh, the prevalence, the symptomatic bleed, symptomatic bleed in a retrospective fashion, rehemorrhage rate. Rehemorrhage rate has been as high as 60% um, reported by the Japanese. The problem is with this rate is that if you look at, for example, the patients that are referred to the Bear Neurological Institute, they are much more likely to have had more than one hemorrhage. And so then if you looked at the re-hemorrhage rate, you would think 
um, that the rehemorrhage rate is much higher than it actually is. Surgery for brainstem cavernous malformation is not without risk. And uh, as we reported, there was 36% had temporary worsening, 11% had a uh, permanent uh, deficit. Most important naturally are the approaches. How do we get to these lesions in a safe uh, manner so that we can resect them? Exposure, I've said it a thousand times, is everything. Very important to recognize that these large veins are not just associated with a cavernous malformation, but they also drain normal brain. So if you take them, you have a significant risk of venous infarction. Image guidance. These lesions can't be operated on in many cases without image guidance. Monitoring, whether it's SSEPs and MEPs, Sharp dissection. I like the patient to be in EEG burst suppression for two reasons. One is the blood volume is decreased, so you have more room requiring less retraction. The second is it gives you some protection for temporary ischemia. And then as my good friend uh, uh, knows, anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. And then I'd like to add on, we should think about avoiding rigid retraction uh, whenever possible. Uh, I won't spend much time on anatomy. Uh, today, you have some incredible anatomists among uh, your Turkish colleagues. And uh, it is important to recognize that when you have lesions which look relatively close together within the brainstem, they have really entirely different approaches in order to get there safely. We published a paper in uh, 2015, and we looked retrospectively at the various regions of the thalamus that we'd operated on and divided them into six different regions. And those six different regions obviously had different approaches to it. And so it just emphasizes that when you have lesions in the thalamus here, you would come from this direction. Here, you would come from this direction. Here, lateral, you'd go contralateral. Here, you'd go posterior, supracerebellar, infratentorial. So uh, the whole philosophy of finding the appropriate approach is the key associated with these lesions. Intraoperative image guidance, absolutely essential. So I, I, I wanna emphasize just a little bit, um, we routinely tend to put retractors into the brain and hold open, um, for example, the Sylvian Fisher by putting a retractor on the temporal lobe and on the frontal lobe. What I want you to try is not to put the retractor to start off with, but only when you really need it. And most of the time, uh, when we published our paper in Journal of Neurosurgery, it was 97% of the time, I did not use a retractor at all. Whether we were walk, uh, operating the posterior fossa, doing a, a, a basilar artery in or some whatever. The vast majority of time, we did not. Picking the right approach naturally is key. And so positioning the patient for me is always a attempt to have like a 45 degree angle down to the, down to the opening and the surgeon being in a comfortable position and the patient being in a safe position. As we make smaller and smaller exposures, we have trouble with light because the zero axis that we get from the camera is offset by the visual axis, which comes in at three to six degree, depending on uh, where you set the microscope's focal length. 
And so the light will bounce off. And so what you wanna do is you wanna add on lighted instruments. Notice how nice this is. I'm using a lighted bipolar made by Cogent. And here it is standard. We get very dark spots. So clearly the light makes a lot of uh, difference. I wanna just show one example that does, that is not a difficult one but that combines the decision-making. We have a small cavernous malformation, back, deep. Uh, here it is pre-op, here it's post-op, pre-op, post-op. Now we're gonna use the robotic function of the microscope. So I've set the entry point and I've set the target point, And now the microscope moves to that axis and then all we have to do is follow this little dot to get right down. So this is an inner hemispheric approach. We're going contralateral. It's just a tiny little opening. You see the lighted uh, sucker, uh, which just gives you such a beautiful visualization. And then this grabbing the cavernous malformation and then using the sucker without any suction on it to wipe away the surrounding cerebral tissue. And that's a very simple way of getting this lesion out. No retractors, inner hemispheric approach. You see the opening in the fox to the other side and, and that's it. What about this one? Let's just analyze what we're gonna do. This is obviously a cavernous malformation. It has bled. And the question is, what approach are you gonna use? Are you gonna use retrosigmoid? Do you wanna come OZ? Do you wanna go supracerebellar infratentorial midline, lateral, or quasi? That's, that's sort of the discussion that we go. And in this case, what we did, we used the supracerebellar infratentorial lateral because this here is really a very good approach. You can see cerebellum here, you see uh, temporal lobe here, so it's a natural plane. You don't go through any brain. So that's the approach for this one that we wanted. And here it is. Uh, this is where the sinus is, tentorium right here. We're coming right down along the side, no retractor in place, no retractor in place. This is not the sitting position. And we get down to the ambient cistern, and then we just use the nonstick bipolars, made by Stryker. And here we have a little closer up of uh, going right through the medial lemniscus to get to the cavernous malformation. And then we remove the lesion. And it's important that, that there's no rush, no retractor. Again, we want to preserve all these little vessels. So you'll see me sweeping them off with a sucker. Remember, the, there's no suction going through the sucker at this point because we have the eye drop opening. And when you don't put your finger on it, there's absolutely no suction at the end. And we just keep mobilizing it back and forth, always a little bit of counter traction until we get the lesion out. And so on, and we'll get it out. Uh, here's decision making. So this is a medical student. Uh, she has this here. She's had a uh, apoplectic event. And the question is really, do you want to operate or not? So the first question is, do you observe or do you operate? Well, she had a pretty pronounced effect. Her memory is at great risk. When you think of uh, the association of this and the fornices, which are sitting right here. So she made the decision to op, uh, she wished to proceed with surgery. Then if surgery, what approach? Inner hemispheric, 
or lamina terminalis. If interhemispheric, which is what I think is the appropriate uh, approach here, this one coming down this way, what position? Do you do the classic one where you, the head is up or do you do my preferred one, which is lateral? So why lateral? Because your eyes are horizontal, your hands are horizontal. So you're much better with vision and utilizing your hands with this. So here we're using intraoperative uh, guidance. We come right down to the cavernous malformation. It really becomes pretty straightforward. Again, you see the light at sucker. We mobilize the cavernous malformation and we take it out. And I, I won't belabor you with it, but here it is. That was the opening, that was the incision, and here's the post-op. And she is perfectly normal. Again, decision-making. So you have this cavernous malformation, which has bled a number of times, uh, quite dangerous because it's intraventricular. So when you bleed and it's an extra lesional bleed, you can have uh, occlusion of the aqueduct. So the first question you really wanna do is, which way are you gonna go? Perfectly reasonable to go through the frontal lobe. How about interhemispheric, transcolossal? That's a long ways to make it over to here. That's a lot of retraction. Or do you wanna go contralateral? through the cingulum, directly to the lesion. And that to me made the most sense. So it's basically like this. So this is how we place the patient. The contralateral hemisphere is dependent. So gravity takes it down and we open the uh, fox as we need it. So again, this is the lesion we're gonna go for. So this, the hemisphere is down. With image guidance, we decide where we're gonna make our opening in the falks. So we make a little opening in the falks. Now we're gonna bipolar a little bit of the cingulum and you go right down to the ventricle. Obviously, Image guidance is essential. You can see how it comes right down to the lesion. And there it is, a beautiful little raspberry cavernous malformation, which we then take out. And here are some of the veins that are part of the cavernous malformation. That's why they fill so slowly. So here we want to be sure that we don't... Uh, lose the cavernous malformation in the ventricular system. So we're being a little bit careful. And then finally, we just pull it through. And there it is. You can see the route that we took right through there. Uh, just a little bit of the spinal cord. These are fascinating lesions. We published over 50 of them. And we just have to remember, how do we get into the spinal cord? And this also applies to the medulla. So you have the classic midline myelotomy, a beautiful approach. You have the substantia gelatinosa or the dorsal root entry zone approach. And you have lateral between nerve roots and dentate. All three of them are safe and all three of them are uh, important. Uh, so here's a giant one. This is a little boy from uh, San Francisco with a ca terrible cavernous malformation. And uh, here it is out, and I don't want to belabor it. He was devastated to start with. Uh, he still had the same minimal function below this uh, after it was taken out. More critical is the midline one. Again, you see the association to the veins. I mean, you just, these little veins are all part of the cavernous malformation. <coughs> uh, the father had a cavernous malformation. The son had a cavernous malformation. They were familial, they had many. Both of them had one right at this level. He had a devastating bleed, was rushed to the hospital somewhere else. 
then transferred over. We operated on him because he still had some sensation, um, but he was devastated from his cavernous malformation. And six weeks later, his father demanded that his be taken out. And this is very straightforward, obviously. And I wish we would have had the opportunity to take out the one in the, in the boy before. More difficult are the ones that are a little farther off the line. Um, this is a patient that also had a lot of chest pain and naturally hemosiderin is associated with that. So this, these are the dorsal nerve roots right there. And then we go right down to the cavernous malformation, gently spread. So we're also helping the pain right away because we're obviously going through the uh, dorsal nerve root zone and there's the cavernous malformation. And then we just take it out piecemeal, make sure that it's completely dry. More difficult is this one. This one is anterior, has bled three times. Uh, this is a triple A personality businessman from uh, Hong Kong. And so here, now we're going, here are the dorsal nerve roots, ventral nerve roots, dentate ligament right here. So we're going below the nerve roots here. And here you see the cavernous malformation. You see the different ages of the hemorrhages by the consistency, some of it old, some of it a little newer. There's a really old one that's already all scarred in. And you just have to keep going until you're sure that you've gotten everything out. There's his post-op and he had no change in his exam. He was normal before, he was normal afterwards. So I want to spend the rest of the time really to go through the various approaches that we've used uh, for these lesions. Um, when you talk about far lateral, um, I, I personally, I started with the big hockey stick incision. Then I went to a lazy S that's lateral because it gets the muscle mass away from you. How much you take off all really depends where you want to go, whether you want to go anterior up here, whether you just want to go here. So it's very much dependent on where you go. But again, you can see just like in the spinal cord, the various access routes that you have available. Uh, this is a uh, editor from uh, London, um, London Times. She actually ended up being the medical editor after a few years, but she has this cavernous malformation in the medulla. And this is the far lateral approach, cutting the dentate ligament. Here you're in front of the medulla and you have a beautiful view, no retractors required whatsoever. And then we mobilize it And you can see that again, the different ages of the blood by the different colors of the cavernous malformation. You see the 11th cranial nerve right here. And there it comes out. And she wrote a book called Dipped into Oblivion uh, and it's a very nice book in the sense of we don't get enough attention or give enough attention to what the, what the patients feel. We see every case right after another. We don't have enough time. And she really relates the agony she went through before she had it finally fixed. Suboccipital, midline, telobelar, these are obviously uh, everyday uh, procedures. And I will only emphasize that it provides an incredible avenue uh, to the exposures of the medulla and the fourth ventricle and laterally. Anatomy, 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 where can we go in safely? What are the safe zones? We can see seven, we can see six. So here's one that had uh, a large hemorrhage patient is already devastated. So it was okay to operate. And right here is where we went in. And you can see 
why we're off a little bit laterally, just like on the MRI scan, we get to the cavernous malformation and we take it out. And, and it's very straightforward. More interesting than this one, and here you see the post-op, the nice cavity with the cavernous malformation gone. More interesting is this one, a cavernous malformation that's off lateral. So we have to be able to get lateral to, to take this out. So we're gonna use the telovelar approach. Same sort of opening. We wanna get down to the brainstem, but here what we wanna do is be cognizant again of the anatomy. And what is nice is that when, when we go out lateral through the telovelar approach, uh, which opens this up widely. You can go all the way out. You can lift up the whole uh, tonsil and get out laterally to all the cranial nerves. Uh, the beauty of this is that it's very, very well tolerated. So the feet are up here and the head is up here. I'm getting pretty good at this. Uh, and then what we wanna do is we wanna go out laterally. So I like to put gel foam into the fourth ventricle so that the blood doesn't go in. Uh, here you see pica. And now we're exposing, we're going around pica, we're exposing the floor of the foramen of Lushka. And it has that classic white color. And then we go through the little bit of the middle cerebellar peduncle, which is very, very tolerant to incision. And we make this opening with image guidance, obviously, to get to the cavernous malformation. And then we take out the cavernous malformation in a piecemeal fashion. And then take out the gel foam. No retractor required. And there's the post up. Retrosigmoid approach, a workhorse, an absolute workhorse of an approach that allows us to do lots of things. So this is a familial uh, cavernous malformation patient. Uh, you can see them all over the place. This is the one now that is symptomatic, uh, but he still has hearing on the left side. So what do we want to do? We want to come in with our approach so it goes through the middle of the cavernous malformation so that we are equidistant from both sides of the cavernous malformation. And the nice thing is that when we're done, again, we can verify that we're at the end of the cavernous malformation. So here we are, exposing along the fifth nerve and we go back and back on the brainstem until we get that perfect angle where we're going through the middle of the cavernous malformation. Just, I can't overemphasize that. This is easy to reach, but if you go this way, you're gonna do a lot of damage to get to this portion. So you have to really go through a little bit of the brainstem to get to the lesion. And then this is a very large one. Uh, so it takes quite a bit of time. You, you, you feel like, you're never getting it out as you get out piece after piece. But look at this here. Despite where we are, there's no retractor in place. Patient is in the park bench or in the lateral position. And we just keep taking it out until it's gone. And here's the empty cavity. And the patient has preserved left hearing. Uh, I want to emphasize this one just for a very important anatomical point. When we reach these lesions, again, the angle is so very, very important. So the key is the middle cerebellar peduncle. So I want you to follow this here because here we're opening the petrosal fissure. Uh, this is Dandy's vein. Always leave it intact. It tells you not to have too much retraction. Again, you don't see a retractor in place. 
I'm just using the instrument for what we call dynamic retraction. And we're gonna follow the fifth nerve to the petrosal fissure. It's just like the sylvian fissure, although it is more fragile. It is more fragile. So just channel spreading, opening it. And, and we keep walking up. We keep walking up the fissure until we see the white matter of the middle cerebellar peduncle. That is it right there. And we just keep going until we get the right angle. Uh, and now we're way up in the fissure. Cranial nerve is way up over here. Now with image guidance, we've decided where to go and we make an opening into the middle cerebellar peduncle, which I said is quite tolerant. And we get to the cavernous malformation. And that's really the important part I wanted to show you. And there's the pole stop. Supercellular infratentorial is a phenomenal gateway uh, to the midbrain all along the tentorium, whether we go far lateral, whether we go midline, whether we go lateral. So here's a classic example, cavernous malformation. The first thing we notice is cerebellum right here, temporal lobe. So this right here is where the tentorium is. So when we come in like this here, it is a straight shot. We go through a little bit of medial lemniscus and we have the lesion right in front of us. So here we are. Ambient cistern, no retractor, fourth cranial nerve, super cerebellar artery, and we're right to the cavernous malformation. I'm using the sucker to hold back the cerebellum a little bit. And then we just keep mobilizing the cavernous malformation. But you see down here, you can see the angle. It is absolutely perfect for getting to this lesion. And here you can see where we entered and you can see the empty cavity. How far can we get with the supracerebellar infratentorial approach? Well, this is a patient uh, that had been previously been operated elsewhere from this approach. Uh, he is now in a wheelchair. He's got this recurrent hemorrhage and the neurosurgeon sent him for uh, another approach. So here we went supracerebellar. Again, note there's no spinal drainage, no retractor. Here, because we have to go up, we're going to cut the tentorium. And you've got to remember that the fourth nerve is in the subarachnoid space. So as long as we stay out of the subarachnoid space, uh, we can cut the tentorium uh, safely and then shrink it back with bipolar and then make an opening guided by image guidance through the medial lemniscus to get to the cavernous malformation. And here you can see it. And it really comes out very nicely. Again, this these are very, very small pituitary-like uh, instruments. And always a little bit of counter traction, making sure we don't have anything caught on it. And this is obviously a very large one with a relatively recent hemorrhage. And another piece. But you can see that no, no, no retractor, just using gravity. And obviously CSF out, we're using a little bit of a, a CO2 laser, not important. And here it is post up. And then I get a letter from the referring uh, neurosurgeon. He's, he is now able to ambulate independently with much better balance. 
And then this is probably uh, the most difficult case for this, this particular approach. Uh, patient uh, had obstructive hydrocephalus, uh, comes from Copenhagen. Here's the lesion, goes all the way up to the foramen of Monroe, occupies uh, the third ventricle, pushing it over. And so here we are again, um, getting down to the ambient cistern, cutting. Notice the angle that we're coming in on. Obviously, we had to open the tentorium. And then with image guidance, we make an opening, just like in the previous case, and then start removing the cavernous malformation. Uh, here we use the CO2 uh, laser again, which helped here. It's not essential in my mind, but some of these pieces were so big, I couldn't get them out through this little opening and the scissors would not go across it. So I used the laser to cut it into half into pieces so that I could take it out. But notice again, no retractor. I'm just using my sucker for dynamic retraction. Yeah, and there's the post up, and here she is uh, just before she's going back home. OC approach, obviously another workhorse. And uh, here it's pretty straightforward. This is a, a very easy place to get to. You could do it this way, but it's hard to get to this portion when you go retrosig. So going this way is a straight line to the most distal portion. And uh, there it is out. And more difficult and better use of the or orbitosigmatic approach is this uh, young woman who's had three hemorrhages and she has a cavernous malformation that's sitting here. And the question is, how do you get here? You can't really come this way because you'd be going right through the peduncle. So you have to come contralateral. So this is gonna be a contralateral orbitosigmatic approach to this cavernous malformation. So here we are, uh, optic nerve, internal carotid artery. In this case, the angle was best between the internal carotid artery and the optic nerve. Now we're in the intrapeduncular space full of tiny, tiny little vessels. And so we're spreading them apart. And now we see the contralateral peduncle. And then I double check, triple check to make sure image guidance is accurate on all the structures I can see before making an opening into uh, the peduncle and then very relieved when you get to the cavernous malformation. And here it comes out. And here you can see how we came across from the other side and the lesion out and she did well. Contralateral transcolosal is again, a uh, operation that we've published a lot about, and it makes sense that you go from this side to get to over here. And so here we are, opening contralaterally, we go out, we go across. <coughs> here we're using a retractor, I'm, I, I never said you shouldn't use a retractor when you have to hold back the brain in order to get there the, or the corpus callosum, then you can see the cavernous malformation very nicely and you take it out. And this was really relatively straightforward because it was a straight shot. And here it is post-op, cavernous malformation is out. More difficult are these. This is one that's hanging on the roof of the third ventricle, right by, right by the fornices. 
So we're gonna go, we're gonna use gravity. I always take the bone across the midline because you wanna pull back the sagittal sinus. Couple of millimeters still help you. For Raymond of Monroe, and so I like opening into the third ventricle lateral to the choroid plexus rather than medial, which is the way it's, it's published in most uh, textbooks, because it gives you one more layer of protection of the fornix. And I have a great respect for the fornix. So here we are. I'm, again, I'm using the little laser here to separate the cavernous malformation from the roof of the third ventricle. And they're pulling it out. Again, you see no retractor. A little more difficult is this one. That's the post-op, looking good. This is a young man uh, who has this cavernous malformation sitting right in the back of the third ventricle and the aqueduct. You can see it here, third ventricle, aqueduct. Here, third ventricle. So we're gonna try to get to it here so that we can get it out. Okay, so now we're back in the same spot again. Here I'm holding over the corpus callosum in order to have access. And now we're looking at the aqueduct. This is in the back end of the third ventricle. And then very carefully, I remove the cavernous malformation in a piecemeal fashion. You know, it's going backwards around it, a little tension here, a little tension there, so that we can remove it without hurting anything. Here's the pre-op, here's the post-op. Here's the pre-op, Here's the post-op, so nicely gone. Last case I wanna show you is uh, this of a six-year-old who had this giant cavernous malformation that was located within the sinus. These are very different animals. They are very, very vascular. Uh, and uh, if they're in the cavernous sinus, you can really treat those with radiation. Uh, but they operated on him for 16 hours. They tried again in Houston to operate on him, and they had to stop because of extensive blood loss. And uh, this is what it looked like, very large. Dr. Albuquerque, my colleague, was able to find one little external vessel that fed the cavernous malformation and put all this onyx in it, which... Uh, you could have bought two Mercedes Benz for. First thing I did was make the craniotomy bigger than they had it before. Then I cut the sinus and tentorium on either side. And I probably didn't need the onyx because that made it uh, devascularized. But you can see the sparking from the onyx when I used the, co the cautery but really came out very nicely in pieces. And there it is, all out. And that's the boy. His mom was Italian, his dad was a doctor in uh, Mexico. And there's the big cavity where we took it out. I had good follow-up on him and I was very unhappy that she kissed him instead of me. Um, this is one year later, you can see the follow-up, um, uh, best in his football, football team, that's soccer, and a very, very good student. And then I, I got uh, follow-up from him nine years later. This is what it looks like, no recurrence. 
excellent student and soccer player. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned safe entry zones. All of these green marks are places where we entered the brainstem or the midbrain, uh, where we've taken out cavernous malformations, uh, which were safe. And uh, all of these are uh, in this book. And uh, you have such an incredible anatomist among you with Khan, uh, really spectacular dissections. And I, I trust you learn from him all the time. So in conclusion, I think surgical resection of deep symptomatic and accessible cavernous malformations is reasonable. When not to operate is just as critical. Knowledge of approaches is key and utilizing image guidance and minimal retraction uh, is essential. Appropriate exposure, that is really the key. Appropriate exposure allows us to resect virtually all cavernous malformations that are indicated uh, for surgery. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. It was a wonderful and inspiring uh, presentation. It's important to uh, know when to operate and when not to operate. Uh, you have shown many approach with quite different examples. Uh, we have watched great videos like poetry and the father and son's case of uh, yeah. spinal cavernous malformations in the same region was a very, what was very interesting. And the last case, uh, giant cavernous malformation uh, was the biggest case I have ever seen. I'm not uh, very experienced, but uh, it was very useful meeting for me and my peers. It's a great opportunity for us to listen to a great uh, surgeon's experiences like you. I'm sure uh, it was a delighted Thursday evening for all the part participants. Uh, well, um, I'm going to read uh, what participants have uh, written. Um, From Mumbai, India, India, Dr. Harshad Parekh uh, say, uh, says uh, hi. And Professor um, Dr. Mehmet Ali Demirci from, from Trabzon. Uh, I guess he will ask a question, uh, but... Uh, and the message uh, didn't come to us. Uh, Noru Luda Maria from Pakistan, I guess. Uh, she thanked a lot for uh, the amazing lecture. And Abdullah Al Numan thanked uh, for incredible lecture. Uh, Francesca Sidi thanked. And Many, many thanks uh, there are from Afghanistan, Dr. Obaid, and from Turkey, Professor Nejat Uçler, thanked. Uh, from Basel Terazi, uh, it was amazing, Rachel. Thank you very much, he said. Um, Norluda Maria, uh, said that we are so lucky to have the privilege of listening to a legend like you, sir. Um, Professor Nezi Oktar said that, uh, thanks for sharing your excellent surgeries. What are your opinions on radiosurgery treatment of melanomas? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it's a very good treatment with the exception of cavernous malformations that are within the vascular sinuses. So if you have one in the, uh, in the uh, 
vascular sinus like the sagittal sinus um, or, or any one of the venous sinuses, those cavernous malformations, because they are so vascular, are very sensitive to focused radiation. But those in the brain stem uh, and elsewhere, the spinal cord, I think radiation is uh, more dangerous than surgery, and I do not recommend it. Um, thank you. If you uh, have uh, anything to say, Professor Nezi Oktar, uh, we would like to hear it. Can we turn on microphone? Okay. Uh, Professor Do uh, Dr. Ali Kazanji uh, from Ankara, uh, based University. Thanks very much for the great presentation. Uh, what you think about stereotoxic surgery for deep sea cavernous malformations? The same uh, question. Uh, from <laughs> Kitahya, <laughs> Professor Hasan Emraydan. Selin, wait a minute, I think. Professor Spencer asked for the question. We'll uh, uh, can you repeat the question? We just lost connection for a second. What do you think about stereotactic radiosurgery? Yeah, I, I don't think much about stereotactic radiosurgery for cavernous malformation. It's very good for small AVMs. It's very good for cavernous malformations within a vascular sinus, uh, but not for the rest of Thank you. Professor uh, Hasan Emre Aydın, thanks for lectures, said that. Uh, Professor Erkin Özgüray from Ege University, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for sharing such wonderful cases and excellent presentation. Um, Dr. Burak Evren, uh, thanks a lot. I want to ask about intraoperative uh, ultrasound. Imagine. Yeah, I, I think ultrasound is a good tool. If, um, if um, it helps you localize a lesion and you don't have image guidance, absolutely. You should use it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mehmet Ali Demirci asked, uh, that what you are doing when you have massive hemorrhage intraoperative, intraoperatively for hemostasis. And second question, I have confused why we preferred contralateral interhemispheric inter approach in the intraventricular coronary malformation. What were the advantages? Yeah, the, the, the reason for the contralateral approach is because it requires less retraction. It's only an angle. It's, it's, it's important um, so that, that you don't have to do a lot of retraction of the hemisphere. Uh, it's only a matter of looking at the angle that is the best way to get there with the least amount of trauma to the brain. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kemal Yücesoy uh, has written that. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Many years ago, you asked your residents about interventricular tumor approaches. If the answer was contralateral ventricular way, you say back to home means you are okay. Uh, I saw you like contralateral approach to cavernomas also. Said it. And third question from Dr. Mehmet Ali Demirci. Uh, what interoperative endoscopy usage in ca cavernous malformation surgery, yeah. especially yeah. asking for potential space it, uh, I, approaches such as supracerebellar infratentrial yeah. approach? I, I think the endoscope is a part of the microscope. And if it allows you to see something that is important, uh, it should absolutely be used. Uh, I think operating just with the endoscope for these lesions is awkward just because of the fidelity of the surgery that's required. Thank you. Professor Sükrü Çağlar from Ankara 
uh, thanks for the amazing lecture uh, he re has written. Uh, and another question from India, what's the best time to operate after hemorrhage? Uh, it depends very much on the patient, what condition they're in. Uh, I think if you, if you have the opportunity to wait um, a few weeks, then it'll be liquid instead of solid. Uh, but in general, um, I had to operate whenever the patient came to me. And since they usually came from a distance, uh, they um, tended to be longer period rather than shorter, except for those that were really emergent uh, where they were rushed right to surgery because their neurological status was so poor. Thank you. Uh, another question from Dr. Under Artem. Uh, I was wondering why we rarely mention anterior cervical approach and if necessary corpectomy for anteriorly located cervical cavernomas. I have seen Midline myelotomies performed for anteriorly located cavernomas, but not anterior approaches. Wouldn't it yeah. be yeah. easier to transfer less medulla spinalis? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. The trouble is, it's the blood supply of the spinal cord. The blood supply comes from from three sources, the two posterior spinal arteries and the anterior spinal artery. And that's the most important. And that anterior spinal artery has circumflex vessels that come around and feed the critical portions of the brain. So if you come in anteriorly and you make a myelotomy, you are going to cut across those arteries and they are critical and you will have a deficit. So for a... Uh, for an anterior located cavernous malformation in the spinal cord, it is still much safer to use a lateral or posterior approach than an anterior approach. Very good question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Hassan Kojeli asked the question, what do you think about the best time after a large bleed at the pons? What's the rate of new or per permanent cervical nerve deficit? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a hard thing to answer because when, when you operate um, after a large bleed, most of the damage is done, but the ability for the brain stem to recover is quite remarkable. So uh, I, don't, don't give up just because you see a big hemorrhage. And whether you have a new neurological deficit depends on what uh, you hurt on the way to get there. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but in general, uh, we found with the, uh, with the long-term follow-up uh, that patients really do remarkably well, even when they start with a very large deficit. Thank you. And, and Dr. Melike Mut from Hacettepe University and from uh, UVA with Dr. Kaan Yamurlu. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. It was inspiring. It's absolute necessity. It's absolute uh, necessity. Very good prevent. question. I can see it on the, on, on the mic. How do you stop the bleeding? from an inadvertently injured vein. The, the thing to remember, it's a vein. And a vein, although it can bleed profusely and a lot of blood can come out, it only takes a little bit of tamponade to stop the bleeding. So gentle tamponade, so you don't occlude the vein, but you just plug it up and you just sit on it until it stops bleeding. Don't bipolar it because you'll kill it. Thank you, Professor. And Dr. Erdal Joshkun uh, asked the uh, same question about radiosurgery. Uh, can you compare surgery versus radiosurgery? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think most, most good radiosurgeons will not radiate cavernous malformations. 
There was a study in the United States that we participated in, in which we said, if you can't operate and there's very good in indication for treatment, uh, then we should consider radiation. And uh, it was run out of Pittsburgh, which was the big gamma knife uh, center in the United States. And nationally, there was not a single patient that was entered because what you couldn't identify a patient that really required treatment without being able to take it out. Now, I have seen quite a number of patients that have been hurt by radiation. And I remember one distinctly, a patient that had familial cavernous malformation and there were twins. One was radiated and she suffered late radiation damage. You gotta remember, you're, you're, you're radiating the brain stem or the thalamus around the lesion. And these are venous lesions, so radiotherapy is not as effective as if they are arterial. So you require a bigger dose or no effect. Uh, I don't think it's a good indication. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Atilla Kazanji from Ankara asked a uh, question. What do you think about significant parenchymal edema uh, surrounding brainstem carinomas may complicate surgical resection in the acute post hemorrhage period? Yeah. Uh, what's interesting <laughs> is, is uh, that you've got to remember that if, if there's an indication for surgery, taking out the hematoma will give that brain a lot less pressure and the ability to recover faster. On the other hand, if, there, if you can wait for that edema to settle down, then the surgery will be easier and a little bit safer. So it's, it's a questionable call as to what to do. Depends on um, the, uh, depends on the specific uh, patient. Thank you. Um, uh, a question from Sh Professor Shikushalar. Do you use bipolar for removing brainstem cavernomas? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I like my bipolars that have my name on them uh, uh, <laughs> that uh, are made by Stryker because they are really terrific for not sticking. The, the uh, I can't say how many times I made the mistake of saying never bipolar in the brain stem or the spinal cord. It's just not true. You can bipolar in the brain stem and the spinal cord. It's better than having bleeding or a post-operative hemorrhage. Just lower it and be gentle. And the beauty of bipolars is that you can be very specific of what you're bipolaring. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Ayhan Kanat has written, thanks for good presentation. What do you think about coronary malformation bleeding secondary to COVID infection or vaccination? I, I, I know there was a case that somebody asked me to review, um, but I really don't know the association. Um, but I, I, you know, when somebody is sick, um, any, any additional morbidity uh, can certainly be expected. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Engindus has written uh, that I didn't see tractography in your cases. Do you, you, do you not use tractography in your yeah. operative we, evaluation? We have used tractography uh, quite a bit. The trouble is that um, when you look at lesions like a cavernous malformation in the brainstem, and you know where the tracks are, uh, the distortion of the tracks becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, and if there is one, um, especially like in the occipital lobe, where you might be able to learn something from tractography, we use it, we use it in the brainstem, but I have not really found it makes a big difference as to uh, the approach we use to get the cavernous malformation out. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there is a um, question from Dr. Mehmet Ali Demirci. He has written that there is no way not to ask when we met 
Dr. Spessler, do you have any plan for education for medical residents in Turkey? What can we do to join your operations? Yeah. Well, that's that's very sweet. The uh, the um, I, I know there are some superb neurosurgeons uh, in Turkey. So uh, for a resident today, it's really so much easier to be exposed to so much, whether it's like a lecture uh, um, today, uh, whether it's a course, um, whether it's the ability to observe. We have lots and lots of uh, foreign students that come and now watch Dr. Lawton. So. I, I'm a big believer in traveling around the world and learning from others. You learn what to do, and you also learn what not to do. Thank you. And the last question from Dr. Oh, Mehmet Sechar. In terms of preventing epilepsy in cavernum surgery, what's your opinion of the excision of the hemosiderine ring in non eloquent area? Yeah. That, that is really an excellent question. I, uh, I've, I've had debates uh, numerous times, and I, I think if, if somebody has seizures from the hemosiderin of the cavernous malformation, because they leach out blood all the time, if you don't do anything but take out the cavernous malformation, you get an 85 plus percent chance of eliminating future seizures. That's a very, very high percentage. For me, if I have a cavernous malformation, I would rather just have the lesion out as a start. If I am one of the unfortunate ones who then would continue to have uh, seizures, then I would do a seizure operation rather than uh, take everybody with a cavernous malformation who has seizures and take out their surrounding functioning brain just because it has hemosiderin in it. Thank you, Professor. And as far as I can see, all questions and comments is, are over. And Professor Suju. Uh, maybe maybe if, I want, you to, want to say something. OK. Thank you very much again. Uh, it's so nice to see you again and again, uh, especially for the young uh, residents and young uh, specialists. Uh, it's so easy to write something. Two, and two years ago, I write a just letter and you accepted me. Uh, and also you gave a badge and it's open all the door. Uh, and also, uh, you open your house to us. Uh, it's so easy. And uh, believe that this uh, neurosurgery is a, another art. And you are a really big artist. <laughs> you are a star. Uh, uh, thank you very much again and again. Thank, thank you. It was a pleasure uh, seeing all of you and giving uh, me a chance to talk to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye. We can't end the event.